Okay, well, it's great to have you join us today. I'm Adrian Randolph, uh, Dean of Wine Northwestern's Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the first virtual conversation for alumni. The goal of this event is to share with you perspectives on the pandemic from faculty experts at Weinberg College. Now, before we get started, a few practical matters. First, if you have any technical difficulties during this talk, please use the chat function, which you'll find hopefully at the bottom of your screen. It just says chat and little uh, bubble above it. Uh, we will try to help you. There are people monitoring that who will try to help you. Second, we will be taking questions for the last 10 to 15 minutes at the end. So please submit them using the Q and A function, which is another function to the right on the bottom of uh, your Zoom screen. And if you submit questions there, we'll try and get to them. So finally, a special thank you to you, our alumni and leadership supporters of Weinberg College, whose investments make so many aspects of the work we do with students, with faculty possible. So thank you very, very much. So let me now turn my attention to the topic at hand, an economist's view of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are undergoing not only a truly shattering and frightening health crisis, but also a financial one. As we see in the newspapers daily, leaders in industry and politics are trying to strike a balance between staying safe, staying safe and reopening. We at Northwestern are grappling with those problems as well. It's great, therefore, to have one of the world's most distinguished economists whose work focuses on such questions with us at Northwestern and with us today. Marty Eichenbaum is the Charles Moskos Professor in the Department of Economics, co-director of the Department's Center for International Economics and Development, fellow of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Econometric Society. And he has served as an advisor to several Federal Reserve Banks of Atlanta, Chicago, San Francisco, as well as to the IMF. Over the last few months, Marty has written several articles on pandemic economics. He's written on the trade-offs between the severity of the recession we face and the health consequences of the pandemic. Much attention has been focused on what he and his co-authors call smart containment. And with that, I want to turn to Marty. Hey, Marty, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Adrian. And I, I want to thank everyone uh, for attending and being part of the community and just express uh, my personal gratitude uh, for all the things that everyone supports and just happy to share thoughts with all of you. So Marty, uh, in the period I work on, the Middle Ages, the plague has long been a focus of economic historians. In your work, I see something similar. You have linked economics and epidemics. Now, epidemiology models are incredibly useful, but you've noticed that they do not always take into account economic considerations. Can you introduce to the audience uh, to some of your thinking about the interplay between health decisions and economic decisions? Sure, thank you. Um, one of the things that my, my co-authors and I, uh, Sergio Ribello and Matthias Trubant, immediately struck us when we started to think about how should the government respond was that epidemiology models uh, are very useful, as you said, but they don't account for the two-way interaction between economic decisions and, um, um, uh, and um, the infection itself. So for example, uh, we know just naturally if people are afraid of getting infected, uh, they're going to cut back on lots of activities like consumption activities, market activities, um, the amount that they work. And that naturally, that behavioral response affects the degree to which the infection itself spreads. And then of course, as the infection itself spreads and those probabilities change, that feeds back into people's economic decisions. So, so it seemed to us that unless you took those factors into account, you wouldn't do a very good job of predicting the course of the epidemic itself when you had these massive behavior responses. And it would be very difficult to give reasonable um, uh, advice to governments. And we're certainly not alone in that. There's just been an explosion of work um, in this area of um, economics uh, interacted with ep epidemiology. So, so, oh, go ahead. Well, no, I was just gonna say that uh, the, the, the epidemic is extremely unusual. So if you think about recessions, uh, to the U.S. economy, we usually think, oh, it's a demand shock 
or it's a supply shock, uh, one thing that immediately strikes you is that this epidemic is both, right? It's an aggregate supply shock because people don't want to go to work. Uh, they, they just a matter of health purposes. So that's a supply shock. At the same time, um, it's an aggregate demand shock because people don't want to go to a rock concert. They don't want to go out uh, to uh, restaurants, etc. cetera. Um, they can substitute a little bit, but on net, there's this big demand shock. So you have a, a, a contractionary negative supply shock, a contractionary demand shock. And what that tells you is you're going to get a recession regardless of what, if the government did nothing, you would have gotten a recession anyways. And so you mentioned, I mean, you, that we have implemented some containment policies uh, and we and countries around the world have done this. And uh, I'm curious what your work can tell us then, if there would have been a recession anyway, uh, what and sort of how containment policies can be most effective? Well, let's take a first cut at that. Um, uh, as you said and mentioned, uh, governments around the world, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, implemented very simple containment measures, right? What they basically said uh, is you can't do things. They, they didn't condition those measures on health status of individuals or age of individuals. It was sort of a blunt hammer. And, and the first question that we might grapple with is, why did the government have to do anything? You know, I'm an economist and I like to think markets work pretty well, so why not let markets work? And the best analogy that I got was actually from a journalist that, that I was talking to, and he came up with the following. He said, you know, think about pollution. When you get into a car, um, you kind of don't think that you're affecting the total amount of pollution out there, and so you just do it. You're not a bad person. It's pretty reasonable for you as a person to think that. But if we all think that, then we collectively produce a socially excessive amount of pollution. So what does the government do? We tax the activities and reduce those, the amount of those activities. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a close analogy with the epidemic. Each one of us has the potential to increase the stock of infections socially, but we're all so small relative to that big stock. We go, well, you know, I'm just going to do what's privately optimal for me. And collectively, uh, we, uh, we produce too many infectious activities. So now you get into this very strange notion of in the epidemic, in the first run, especially if you take running, overrunning medical facilities, et cetera, the government needs to correct that form of pollution. And that will take the form of cutting, making an even bigger recession initially, which is a little bit scary. So th that's basically why you want the government to intervene, but then you have to say how, right? So the simple containments, as you noted, very brute force, uh, they are beneficial relative to doing nothing. But the question is, as we're seeing, the cost is so enormous for, for, for individuals in terms of the economy, it pushes us to think about things like smart containment, that's a term we've used, which do condition on health status, do condition on age status, do condition, uh, use tracing and, and other measures of that nature. So that term, smart containment, which has made a few headlines, uh, it really resonates with me and I'm sure with many people. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? You said there are these certain conditions. What else does it mean to you? Well, okay, so, so I'm going to be a little bit technical and I hope that's okay with you and, 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 our, and our friends online. And I'm going to switch to some slides that I prepared to help discuss this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to share screens and, and I hope that uh, that works. Fingers crossed. Okay, and I'm going to put this in full screen. And does that work? Does everybody, do, can you see that, Adrian, on my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So let me provide a little bit of background to provide some context. Um, the original model uh, for infections that we build on and most people build on is actually by two gentlemen from, from Britain, actually, Kermack and McKendrick. They wrote this thing down in 1927. And the thing that we talked about before, they had these exogenous uh, transition probabilities between health states. So the, the idea was that you take the population, you can divide it up into four groups. There are people that are susceptible. So there are people that haven't been yet exposed to the disease. There's infected. So those are people who have contracted the disease. There are people that are recovered. Uh, so to be recovered, you have to have survived the disease and acquired immunity 
we'll come back to that perhaps later, acquired immunity, is that really realistic? And then of course, sadly, there are people that are deceased. Now, in a basic model, in the most basic model, you want people interacting and taking this seriously. So some of the people who took undergrad econ might remember there's little math squiggles, but in the real world, people interact in goods and labor markets, not just through math function. We're in touch with each other. And so generally speaking, you want to think about new infections arising from three types of social interactions. The first I've called non-economic social interactions. They're friends going for a walk. They're, you know, going to your community, to your, to your church or synagogue, whatever. Uh, they're not motivated by market forces particularly. But there are two other classes that very much are, and that is your consumption-based activities mm -hmm. um, and work-related activities, going to the office, working in a factory, uh, et cetera. Uh, and through those interactions, susceptible people can become infected. Exactly what those probabilities are, are exactly what epidemiologists are very, very useful on in, in supplying to social scientists. The, the, you know, for example, if you're a school, uh, the interactions in school give rise to many more infections uh, than interactions, say, um, uh, actually at most forms of work. But so you can use that information to calibrate things. Um, and as I said, I'm going to assume for now that recovered people can't become infected again. In the model, you're going to, we are going to say what happens if the government does nothing, what happens if they do simple containment, um, and simple containment is going to effectively become, think of it as a tax on consumption activities, it's going to be helped to quantify how severe the limitations are. Now, when you write down a model like this, you've got to take a lot of, a stand on many, many things. So infections, probability, how risk averse are people, right? So when you go to your local grocery store, are you really paranoid? Like some people in my house, I won't mention whom, or uh, are you say, well, you know, I'm gonna roll the dice, I go to Vegas, why not get a, an apple from my local store? So preferences matter. Constraints on the medical system are very, very important, especially at the early stages of, 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 the, of these sorts of episodes. Very critically, what's the probability of a future arrival of a vaccination? You, you need to think about those issues. And of course, the probability of a cure, but those are all kind of details. What I've got over here is uh, a picture and um, the blue uh, graph, if you like, is what happens in the model if we have an infection and the government doesn't take any steps. So it's a sort of the Milton Friedman equilibrium where you say markets are markets, let's see what happens. And what you see here is a sort of a classic epidemiology story uh, where you get a surge of infections and exactly how big depends on various assumptions we've made. Um, the, notice the blue line over here is aggregate consumption. So if the government does nothing, as I mentioned before, you're gonna get a recession as people back away from market activities. That's what this aggregate consumption is. And maybe the peak to trough decline, as you can see, is quite substantial, 15%, which actually is kind of lower than we're actually seeing. Um, and sadly, you get a large number of deaths. This is expressed as an initial percent of the population. We don't have to get bogged down in the numbers, but the point is you get a big surge, you get a recession and a lot of deaths. Now, with simple containment, so this is the best simple containment that doesn't condition on people's age, health status, et cetera, it's as if the government initially imposed a 40% tax on consumption. That's, it's an as if, right? So it's one metric to make it real. And then that tax surges to almost 80% as the infection gets very big because the externality is getting big. There's lots of pollution out there. It's really important to get rid of some of that pollution. And then eventually that optimal containment tax comes down. And what you see here is that, well, how did that translate in terms of economic activity? Well, the government took a recession and made it even bigger. In the course of, effect, of, effect, of dealing with that pollution, it made the recession worse. And that's exactly what we see. And that's exactly what people are complaining about. Notice in the course of doing that, they saved a ton of lives. So if you compare this line, that's the deaths with the optimal containment, simple containment, uh, you are getting much less lives, but the trade-off 
between health and economic activity is brutal, right? So you really are scrunching the economy to get those health benefits. Let's go to a very topical picture, which everybody will be very uh, uh, sympathetic to, I hope, to the importance of it. What if that trade-off is so brutal that the pressure on our politicians is relentless to get rid of containment measures before they should? So what this picture, let's just focus on the first row. The dotted black line is something that we just saw. That's optimal containment. Um, the red is an interesting counterfactual experiment. It says, what if we start on optimal containment and then after 12 weeks, the pressures on the government are so much that they say, you know what, we're opening up. We're not gonna do it in a smart way, we're just gonna open up. Well, what you can see is that two things, you're gonna get a resurge of infections. So that's what that red thing is. Let's go to aggregate consumption. What did you buy for it? You will get a surge in consumption and market activity as you initially get rid of containment. But as the infection kicks in, everybody freaks out again. No one wants to do consumption. No one wants to go to work. And now notice you just enter into a second recession. So you got this little uptick in consumption you're going to get another recession, but look what happens to deaths. You've paid a terrible price for that little surge in consumption. You go from deaths as represented by the dotted black line to deaths represented by, this is as a percent of the initial population. So you're getting a, at best a very short lived resurgence. Okay. The same model will tell you, for example, if you started containment too early, and there was a big article about in the New York Times today, you would also pay a very big price for starting too early. But this is focusing on stopping too early. So let's get to something that we might call a, an example of smart containment. Well, if you're going to, uh, smart containment, if you're going to figure out how to just treat people differently based on their health status, you have to test them. Right, that, that's a sine qua non uh, that we need to test them. So let's imagine an experiment in which the government tests some percent of the population that hasn't been tested, let's say alpha percent. And we can talk about alpha has to be in a couple of minutes. And I'm gonna think of two forms of smart containment. The first is simple, which is if I find out that you're infected and I understand there's type one and type two errors, but suppose the tests indicate you uh, uh, are infected, you can't go to work, you're isolated. You have to be quarantined. We'll give you consumption, okay? But in the simple containment, I'm not gonna prevent you from non-economic social interactions. You can still go for a walk because I can't monitor you yet. You can't do a variety of things, but you can't go to work and you can't go out to restaurants or normal consumption. An even fancier form of containment, which is not entirely hypothetical, is strict containment, which says not only can infected person not go to work or get consumption, they have to be socially isolated. Have any governments done this? Yeah, if you fly into Israel right now, first 14 days, you're in a government hotel, in a government facility, right? So it's not an entirely hypothetical. Now, to be clear, and this is the, the crazy economist in me, if you test but you don't contain, you can make things worse. How, how would that be? Well, if all I, if I know that I'm infected, I can't get reinfected, right? I'm already infected. So I'm gonna be much less cautious in my consumption activities, in my work activities, because I, you know, the worst has already happened, so I may as well get on with my life. So if you're gonna test, it's not enough to just test. You have to test and then act on the basis of that information. So here is the good news, okay? So now I bought a really complicated graph. The blue, if you remember, is what we basically just saw. That's you know the, the Milton Friedman thing, just let the market do what it's gotta do. The red thing was the optimal simple containment that we just, um, the, ah, sorry, the, the, uh, the testing and smart containment is the red. So here we wanna ask, what did uh, smart containment do? Well, there's two ways to see the importance of that. If you compare this red and this blue, you see that smart containment certainly lowered the amount of infections. So that's kind of good. But let's go to the aggregate consumption figure. Notice that you would have had this kind of recession if you did nothing, 
Now with smart containment, you have an even smaller recession. So I've, I've, I've done a jujitsu on that trade-off, right? I've reduced the number of deaths from the blue to the red. I've reduced the number of infections from the blue to the red, but I've actually made the recession smaller than it would have been if we'd done nothing. Remember before, before when we had sort of blunt force containment, we got better health outcomes, but we had to have a bigger recession. Here, we have a smaller recession. And why is that? The intuition is very simple. If we are really quarantining infected people effectively, the rest of us don't have as much to worry about when we go consuming, when we go to work. And so naturally the market responds to that by having less of a recession. How cost, well, two things. If you do this early on, there aren't that many infected people and you, it, you're not, the costs are not very large. The longer you wait, the more people you have to quarantine, the cost you go up. But to put the cost in perspective, um, I did a quick calculation yesterday. The government has already spent $2 trillion on fiscal programs. The Federal Reserve's balance sheet went from roughly $4 trillion. It will soon get to $9 trillion. So we're spending about I noticed the eyebrows and that's the right response. That's a, that's a big number. So the government is spending $12 billion a day. So ask, we should ask ourselves, should some of that money have, suppose this costs 500 billion bucks, the social returns relative to alternative forms of investment are enormous. Just in going from this blue line, this kind of a recession to that kind of a recession. So that's, that's, the, um, that's the big picture then is, by the way, is this hard to do? Yeah, of course it's hard to do. We would have to be testing a non-trivial part of the population a great deal of the time. It's an enormous challenge, but almost certainly the return to that activity would be very large. I mean, that's great. You've done a great job at taking some very complex charts and I'm sure there'll be questions about it uh, and making it somehow legible to someone like me. Uh, I must say something really echoed with me because so much has to do with trust. We're thinking about that at the university as well. How do you develop the trust uh, of people, you know, to come back and work? And I think that sort of underpins what you're saying. I noticed on, the, on this slide, you show those who are recovered. Uh, I assume, given what I've read in the papers, that uh, this is somewhat a difficult sort of category. Is that something you can sort of feel confident about uh, in your models and forecasting as you move forward? And the answer is no. Um, so what we know is uh, from other diseases, so not necessarily from COVID, but similar diseases, that epidemiologists tell us that there's a reasonable chance that someone who is, quote, recovered, so they didn't die, thank God, from the infection, they're feeling mm -hmm. better, within a year or two, they can become infected again. We don't know that that's a fact, but it is definitely a possibility, and we have very little evidence or hard evidence to neglect that possibility. So this is rerunning our model with the possibility that you become reinfected after having been recovered within about two years, or you're susceptible again. And what's the blue? Well, the blue is if the government did nothing, notice that we get these recurring waves, right? So we get naturally second, third infections, they're damped in oscillation, so they're not explosive. That, of course, depends on the science and some assumptions we've made. Uh, the death toll is dramatically larger. But now, notice that if you do either optimal, uh, simple containment, uh, with, that is to say, reinfections and smart containment, or you do this social isolation, you get rid of them. So the same policies that worked uh, in the world where recovered people couldn't get reinfected, continue to work. And if anything, they just emphasize how critical it is that we set up the social apparatus uh, mm -hmm. for uh, testing, widespread testing, and acting on the basis of that information. Okay, that's really uh, resonating with me and what we're thinking about. You know, uh, I can really sort of get what you're saying when you say that. I have one last question, and I'm gonna remind the group out there uh, that if you have questions, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be collecting those and I'll return to them afterwards. So my last question is, uh, which maybe you have slides on, you, you know, you can talk about, 
before we get to the questions of the audience is what do you think does lie ahead? Given all that you've shown, uh, what do you think the, I know, you know, economists hate this question, I know, Marty, but, uh, you know, if you had to look into your crystal ball, what do you think it looks like uh, looking down the road? Well, with the appropriate caveat, uh, you know, so many members of the audience will initially remember V-shaped recoveries and, you know, we're going to bounce up, we're going to bounce down. And in my own work with the private sector, you know, that's what everybody was initially hoping for. No one's thinking about these anymore. So rather, the, let me just give you, rather than my own forecast, this is comes from um, the uh, blue chip forecasters. And you see there's a big range and there should be. And I want to emphasize any person who did these forecasts uh, did so with some health scenario in the back of their head. So that's all very conditional. So the real uncertainty is enormous. But what you see is, I'm not sure if this is a swoosh, there's all kinds of things people are talking about, but you see this very sharp drop. You know, Q2, we're talking about just, this is on an annualized basis, so it doesn't mean GDP is dropping this quarter, but on an annualized basis, mm -hmm. it happened for, you know, you were talking about 36% drop in GDP. Um, for the, I, I actually, and then you see somewhat of a recovery from the trough. So you see these numbers, you see that trough, for the year on year, you're talking about a 6% drop in real GDP. That is also what the IMF comes in at. I frankly think that that is uh, optimistic. Um, I think if we have a premature uh, stop in containment policies and a serious resurgence uh, of the disease, the economic implications, because people won't trust what the government's telling them anymore, I suspect that risk aversion coefficient is going to shoot up through the roof. And if that happens, the health outcomes will be worse and these numbers will be worse. Just let me say, what does that mean in terms of unemployment? Right now we're talking about, you can see how people, you know, when you talk about unemployment, there's actual declared unemployment, people dropping out of labor force. I think we're gonna go well over 20%, right? So which would make it the worst unemployment since the, uh, the well, worse maybe than the Great Depression. Uh -huh. And this is my last slide, I promise. This is the government debt, and this is according to the Congressional Budget Office. And what you can see is, you know, in 2000, when everybody was very upset about the debt to GDP ratio, it was about 30%. Before, during, uh, coming out of the 2008 crisis, you see that debt to GDP went up. We are now seeing this wild, sharp increase in debt to GDP. These are World War II numbers. Right, so these are unprecedented. These assume these assume that the government doesn't change what it's doing, uh, but these you want to ask what would have happened if this debt part of it had been incurred towards infrastructure projects aimed at health, namely testing and quarantining. I suspect that would have been a much better investment than some of the things that we're doing now. Wow. Well, Thank, you. Slides. Thank you very much. I'm sure we're going to have some follow-up questions on those issues, but I just want to thank you so much for sharing your perspectives uh, and information about your research. Now we have many guests. Let me just take a look at the Q&A and see what's come in. Uh, this is from, uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to your last name, Delaney Winsley. Or Winsley. Uh, what are some of the rules or parameters of smart containment? Well, there are a couple things. Uh, if we focus in on health status, the, the, the critical point is, do I have reliable, well, not even, so we, let's be careful. I, I, I don't want to make the perfect the enemy of the good. So suppose tests aren't perfect, and there are some people that we call infected that really aren't. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the seems to me the wise thing to do in those circumstances is to quarantine people like that while treating them extremely well in terms of consumption, they can be at home, et cetera, et cetera. So a key parameter is how quickly can we get the tests up and running and how can we monitor the quarantining? That's very important. Age, very, very important. Uh, if you look across countries, Israel had very high infection rates, but relatively low death rates. And the reason is that they impose much stricter rules of containment on elderly people than they did on non-elderly people. Uh, you can imagine that as dean of the college, you would say people under 35 can teach and old guys like Marty maybe have to do Zoom for a while. That will be an example of smart containment. Yeah. So that's just a couple examples.
And that actually uh, links up to another question I'm seeing here uh, from uh, Jeremy Lazarus saying, uh, Marty, your model does not include the influence of political differences, which may avoid looking not only at scientific evidence regarding the pandemic, but also at economic realities. Anything to opine here on the political psychological factors? Well, so first, Jeremy is right about that. And let me say, it seems to me that his point only makes more important smart containment versus dumb containment. The simple fact is many people really suffer under you know, simple containment. There are real people out there that have to feed their families and they're going broke and the political pressure from those folks is reasonable and I, we, everyone should be sympathetic to their plight. The right response to that is to push smarter forms of containment to make it easier for the politicians to deal with those pressures. That, I mean, that's... We'll keep on hoping they're reading our work. Uh, <laughs> on, uh, this is from Mike. Uh, on slide eight, five of the charts look to be incidents by unit of time, while the death chart looks like it's cumulative. Is this correct? That if is correct. Not, why would the death rate shoot up out of proportion to the other factors? Oh, just because it's going, it's not so much, uh, so the infection starts as uh, more people get infected and there's a lag between when they get affected and when they die, unfortunately, and we're plotting the cumulative number of deaths, you're seeing, uh, you know, bigger and bigger numbers because we're going over longer and longer in time as we integrate over all the poor souls that have passed on. Uh, this is similar to the other question, but maybe it, uh, you can uh, think about this from Chris, Chris Schmidt. Uh, thinking specifically about the United States, has there been any modeling to take into account political limitations to smart containment, inability to mandate individuals to be tested, potential inability to enforce shelter in place orders, et cetera? You know, people have started to think about this, but, but uh, it's difficult. Let me just say there are really important cultural differences between different countries. Yeah. So, you know, look, I, I tend to spend a lot of time thinking about Israel for a variety of reasons. And on first glance, you might think Israel would just be, you know, Israelis can't even agree to stand in a line at a theater. Yet in this crisis, with a few exceptions in particular communities, they've really come together. Why is that? They're used to wars. Right? They're used to the red flag going off and saying, oh yeah, this isn't normal times. Now we do what our commander says. That's been very helpful. Americans are a different breed. And so, you know, I, I'm not a political scientist. I'm sure we have people on faculty that are thinking about those issues. Um, I'm sympathetic to modeling those things. But as I say, right now, what we've done is emphasize the importance of making the trade-off as easy for society as possible. Mm -hmm. It sounds, Chris, like that might be a good uh, discussion item for another virtual conversation with a political scientist talking about cultural differences across the world in response to this. Uh, Scott Shea is asking, are there inflationary implications of the approximate doubling of the Fed balance sheet? Will the drop in aggregate demand offset that somehow? So I think in the short run, so it's very, so this is a great question and I really don't want to get technical here. I do think in the short run, uh, the, the, the collapse in an economic activity uh, will overwhelm any of, uh, because the money's not really circulating, it's sitting in banks, right? It's not out there circulating. Over time, what I worry about is as the debt to GDP gets very large, there will be a recovery and the Fed will naturally want to increase interest rates. And that's mm -hmm. what they do. And, but if the debt is so large that increasing interest rates sends us off on some death spiral in terms of national debt, right? Because you have to include the cost of servicing the debt. There will be enormous pressures on the Fed not to do it. That's the scenario that a lot of us very much worry about. And the Fed has crossed lines it's never crossed before. Mm -hmm. um, so usually you do monetary policy, it's the interest rate, it's somewhat vague. The Fed's getting involved in all kinds of detailed activities that the politicians are now aware of. So I think the Fed understands that. I think they're nervous about it, but I think their, their view is in the middle of a war, you don't worry about the precise terms of the peace treaty. First, let's win the war. But uh, it's a concern. Yeah. 
Uh, this is from Joel Fridman. Uh, Marty, how de facto vaccine development and actual distribution to the general populace into your modeling of GDP? Oh, so, so we have that. Uh, so in the model, uh, to be a little bit technical, there's a probability, it's a probabilistic event. And so then the question is when people are thinking of their expectations, on average, how long do they think the vaccine is going to take? Our initial take on this was on average, it would take about two years for the vaccine to be developed and ready to be deployed. Uh, we do a sensitivity analysis uh, we, because there's an unprecedented effort to develop the vaccine, but vaccines take a long time. So, uh, you know, Joel's exactly right. That's a very important parameter. It wouldn't overturn the principle, but it would certainly change the numbers. So another question, this is from Rich Timberg. Uh, will this radically higher level of debt everywhere in the world be a new norm and thus not affect interest rates the way they did in the past? You know, it's a great question. Uh, economists used to think that if you had these kind of debt levels, then mm -hmm. interest rates would have to rise. Um, no doubt the audience has noted that the interest rate on their investments, on their fixed income investments has gone down, not up. So right now, the contractionary forces in terms of the demand for capital investments is so non-existent, right? Who's opening up big plants? That that's been more than enough to counter. And there's just generally been a flight to safety, right? When the world is this crazy, what do you do? You know, lots of people just stick it in the T-bill, right? Yeah. And so that, that's been pushing interest rates down. Will that persist for the next three, four years? Well, we go back to the scenario. If and when the recovery begins, there will be an awful lot of pressure on interest rates down the line. I totally agree. Yep. So from Michael Dow, uh, what is the best way to deal with massive debt level, the massive debt level we are heading to further financial repression? Rep a repression? Or is there a scenario where you can envisage where some debt, mostly likely foreign holders, is repudiated? What are the limits of US debt insurance money printing? So let me say, I, I am not a big favor of debt repudiation under any circumstances. I thought Alexander Hamilton got this right in 1776. And the reason we can borrow now is because we've never repudiated the debt. Uh, I could tell you how we did it after World War II. Mm -hmm. Uh, after World War II, the view was that uh, we have this enormous debt to GDP, that all future generations should pay for it, right? Because to win the war, it wasn't just that generation that benefited. The government did a, 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 a combination of financial repression, which is a fancy word of saying they increased the demand for things like treasury bills because they made it harder to buy other assets. Mm -hmm. So there was some of that, and that may happen. The other thing is, if we went from inflation of 2%, to 4%, let's suppose. That has a huge impact on the debt to GDP. Uh, that's what they did after World War II. It would not surprise me if, despite what they say about a 2% inflation target in the future, I'm not talking about the next two, three, four years, because there will be very little pressure on interest rates till then. At some point, it would not surprise me in the future. Now, by the way, the bond markets, they see no sign of this. If you look at long-term bonds, right, I don't see any sign of an inflation premium, but it wouldn't surprise me if it came. We'll keep our eye on that. Uh, this is from uh, Jeff, either Huthling or Heuthling, I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. Uh, are you aware of countries other than Israel that have done a good job at smart containment that we could evaluate as Americans? Sure, I think the Asian countries have done it. The Koreans were at the absolute leading edge. They were early on, they did testing, they did quarantining. Uh, they've just done a better job than us. So Taiwan has done a terrific job. So it's, now there's some cultural issues there as well, going back to a previous conversation, but in terms of actual policies, they were early on, they were smarter, they got more done. Uh, this is from Jeremy Lazarus again. Uh, would it be interesting to do a program on the crossovers and divergences between medical and business ethics? Yes, uh, that may not be for Marty. That's for us, I think. Uh, yeah, we will. That sounds very interesting. Uh, this is from Paul Lasso. Hi, Paul. Uh, from what I've read, indoor spaces with long interactions of individuals, say in a prison or large gatherings like funerals, have a higher degree of infection rates. How can smart containment take into account greater risk situations as outlined? 
it's a terrific question. Um, you know, one thing we've done with prisons is we've said if you're a nonviolent offender, you really don't have to stay in jail. And that's not just being concerned about the bad guys, quote unquote, but about the prison guards, about the normal people who work in those environments. It has to do with Northwestern. Do what size class do you want to have for Econ 101 and how much distance do we want to have between students? That's information that the, the scientists really can help us with. And I'm sure Adrian is thinking about exactly that point as we go into the fall. Big sports events, big fan of sports, but do we really want to open up the Wildcats where kids are sitting next to each other in the fall and say, maybe we don't want to do that because the risks are too large. Sounds like we need smart social distancing uh, models as well. Uh, Bob Shaw is asking, what will the impact of disrupted trade within the US be? It'd be a global trade? Um, it says within US, but I think possibly both. Let's say global. Well, there, there's, Larry Summers had a, I was listening to something he was saying the other day and we were talking about this and he said, he thought, I'm going to broaden the question a little bit, that COVID is going to accelerate trends that had already existed. Um, it's not going to necessarily change those trends. It's going to accelerate those trends. Um, I can well imagine that we know there are terrific um, pushback against globalization. And I have very mixed emotions about that pushback. Uh, I think on net globalization has been a force for progress and, and for good economics, but there's no question that people have suffered. Uh, supply chains will change uh, for any of the you know, business folks out there. Um, you know, if you were really reliant on China, you must be awfully nervous right now. So just as a natural matter of caution, I think our business people are going to cut back um, and that, you know, that's costly. That's costly, but it may be the right response. I think just as a side note, I think what Larry Summers was saying has also been part of what's been said in uh, sort of academic circles about higher education. You know, it's going to accelerate the changes that we've already seen rather than necessarily mean a disruption entirely to those processes, but we'll see. I think I've got time for one more question. Uh, uh, I'll try and sneak to it and let's see how it goes. Uh, Scott Shea is asking, uh, all charts on GDP indicated that the structure of the economy will remain the same. With the dramatic changes in people working from home, doing countless uh, contactless transactions, et cetera, will COVID-19 trigger a negative secular change in the economy? Uh, well, this is very much builds on the things we were just discussing. Um, yeah. We know there are going to be important sectoral changes. Um, those will be accelerated. Um, that can be a force for good things, uh, but change is costly. Um, there are various people working on these trends. I myself have just gotten data. It's actually quite really cool data on weekly data by consumption sector in different states and zip codes, etc. So we can actually track how those changes are occurring across different categories. But, you know, if you're in commercial real estate, um, you know, you should be nervous or I'm nervous. Uh, we just need less space in the end. There's going to be a readjustment there. If you own a movie theater chain, you should be nervous. Uh, we're already streaming a lot. This is just going to accelerate that. Travel, um, there's going to be less of it, right? We're probably, businesses are finding out right now that they didn't need people on the road quite that much. There's a lot they can do from home. So that's productivity enhancing, actually, in the long run. But mm -hmm. we have to get there. And so that's going to hurt in the short run to get to a better long run. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to have to close this out. Thank you, Marty, so much. It's great to see you. Be well. I hope everyone's good at home, okay? Uh, it was fun. Thank you, everyone. Uh, to all of you tuned in, I hope that you found this to be an interesting and valuable way to spend uh, three quarters of an hour. It was really uh, great to interact with Marty and hear your questions. As I said before, this is uh, just the first of some of our virtual conversations. We plan to do more, and thanks for your suggestions. Uh, so to stay up to date, please look at our website. It's called pandemic.weinberg.northwestern.edu. You can Google it, you'll find it. And we'll share information about future discussions. So from all of us at Weinberg College and Northwestern University, thanks so much for participating, and I hope you have a good and safe day.